in the Oswaldo Cruz Institute, Rio de Janeiro, and Institute of the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome you to this meeting, Multiomic Analysis of Human Immune Response in Inflammatory Disease. Our Vice President for Research and Biological Collections uh, may appear later today. He is in, in, uh, in some place in the North Atlantic between England and Portugal. So if he arrives on time in Portugal, we'll still have the opportunity to have this, his address today. And our previous meeting, uh, uh, Symposium on Regulation of the Immune Response in Chronic Inflammatory Disease was held in June, 2019. And this is a warm up meeting that we hope will be followed up by a second meeting in September 2022, and hopefully in person. So, okay. So uh, this is the organizing committee uh, uh, for this meeting. Uh, includes Maria Cristina Vidal Pesolani, another senior investigator of the Oswaldo Cruz Institute of our lab, Leticia Miranda Larry Santos, that provided us a really invaluable input in, in, in organizing this meeting, and Mariana Gandini, that helped us to plan for the inclusion of the network of technological platforms in field crews in this meeting. So we have a network of core facilities included in the meeting that can uh, help people that are watching this meeting and plan to do experiments using a multiomic approach to investigation of immune response, human immune response and others I didn't remember, but were decisive in creating the conditions for this virtual meeting. Well, in, in, in order to uh, organize this new approach to investigation of immune and inflammatory response, we needed a uh, what I would call a zero project. So we have been for a long time, we started a few decades ago, investigating human interaction with mycobacterium lab. Um, and we had a few results prior to, the, to this COVID pandemic in a series of projects uh, with a um, major collaboration with Colorado State University, the group of Professor Patrick Brennan and John Belisle. They will be participating in this meeting and we hope that the several speakers that you have the opportunity to contact will provide you with some pathways to the kind of approach we are proposing now. We, when we look at mycobacterium leprae infection, uh, this is a first point. The latent infection can be very long, can last more than two decades before onset of active disease. So if you are trying like us to look at the effect of the level of exposure to mycobacterium leprae and bacillary load in the pattern of immune and inflammatory response and of an individual, it's very difficult. It's basically impossible to follow single individuals for a long time. This actually has been done in the uh, outpatient unit at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. We have people that have been following for more than 20 years, but it, it's not very easy and information about these volunteers 
disappears uh, uh, along the time. It's so the easiest way to do this kind of approach is to have individuals with uh, a history, an epidemiological history uh, that tells you that they have different times of exposure to mycobacterium leprae. For example, a, a 14 years old child can't be exposed to mycobacterium leprae for more than 14 years. This is actually an important information because if you think that you uh, interrupted transmission of lepros in, in a given area, a clear signal that you actually su succeeded is the fact that you don't have children anymore with leprosy. So this is an interesting indication. And of course, the patients will become older and older over time. A second point in this infection is that only a small proportion of the exposed individuals evolves to active disease. One of the possible explanations, you have some genetic difference, uh, lifestyle difference also. But another point is that probably you need two uh, different uh, features to have the evolution to disease. The first is the, uh, is the exposure to mycobacterium leprae. And the second is con contact with multibacillary patients. The patient provides an exogenous source of bacilli that may interfere with the response to the factor function against mycobacterium leprae in, in the exposed individuals. There are data showing that once you treat the index case, the household contacts of leprosy patients improve uh, indicators of response to mycobacterium leprae. Another problem is that obtaining mycobacterium leprae for experimental use is a really challenging endeavor. But recently, uh, Flavio Lara, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an investigator in our group, uh, obtained uh, mycobacterium leprae from cultures of derived from tick cell lines. You, you can even develop transgenic mycobacteria mycobacterium leprae with fluor, expressing fluor chrome proteins. So yeah, we hope this can be very useful in, in the near future. Well, and, and finally, uh, this is a problem that to some extent happens with tuberculosis. It's not so easy. You don't have animal models that replicate the long-term aspects you see in in the human disease. It's a different uh, length in the life and also a different lifestyle if you compare humans and, and, and mice. So this is the previous result uh, uh, we had. You can see basically as you increase you have people that have not been exposed to mycobacterium leprae. When you use um, synthetic, M. leprae specific synthetic peptides to evaluate response to M. leprae, in this is a five day assay. We stimulate peripheral blood leukocytes with synthetic M. leprae specific synthetic peptides or M. leprae sonicate. And then you see that if you have people from non-endemic areas, you basically get no response. And as you increase exposure to M. leprae, there is a point you reach a peak of response. But above this level of exposure, you basically you keep uh, the response, response is downregulated. And the, this extreme point here are multibacillary leprosy patients. You can see that the response really goes down. And, and if we analyze in the same groups, the level of anti-phenolic glycolipid one antibodies, 
an indicator of bacillary load. You can see that it's the opposite. So as you increase the, ex uh, the exposure of the group to mycobacterium leprae, you have above a certain level, you begin to, to have a re reduction in, in levels of response. So uh, we took, taking these observations in consideration, we, we proposed this view, for this model for what's going on here. The individuals from non-endemic area in Brazil and also from the Netherlands, they basically don't respond to this kind of stimulus. Um, and then you have an endemic controls with high, highly hyper endemic areas in, in Brazil. You actually don't need to have uh, contact with a uh, multibacillary patient to have a high level response to M. leprae. You need just to live in, in a high endemicity area. Um, and finally, when we look at the household contacts of patients, as you increase the bacillary load of the patient, the response in the contact goes down and you still have a reasonable level of production of interferon gamma in the palsy bacillary patients, and then a very low level or, or no production in, in the multi bacillary ones. So this is the observation that triggered our proposal that this down regulation of MLAP specific gamma interferon production uh, could be the result of, of two elements. Uh, micro environmental changes induced in the host by mycobacterium leprae and, and uh, induction of regulatory T cells specific for mycobacterium leprae in, in the exposed individuals. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the hypothesis we have been investigating. The, the, these two aspects, changes in the microenvironment and the presence of in proportion of, of effector and, and regulatory T cells that respond to mycobacterium leprae. Well, so this, is, this was some time ago and we would like to take into consideration uh, some aspects, especially when we think uh, about our forward approach to this problem. Um, some time ago, uh, th this paper by Berra and co-workers was published in, in Nature, a, a paper showing that when you work with um, specific pathogen-free mice, you have a pattern of response to infectious agents. That's different. If you compare with a pet shop mouse or a mouse obtained from the environment. And actually, if the main reason for that is probably you, you don't have the same tissue resident T cell populations and other resident populations with the same, same epigenetic changes you would have if you spent a, a few decades being exposed to environmental and infectious agents. So this would be one point. A second point in our planning is that we, most of the time when you work with human immune response, you tend to work with blood, but let's say uh, most of the action happens in the tissues. You, I, I think you can have some information from the blood and sometimes it's the only a biological sample you have access to. But ideally, you should take a look at lesions and normal tissue areas. In leprosy, two tissue regions that would be very interesting to look at are the, the skin, including peripheral nerves in the skin, and respiratory tract, 
mucosa. So it's mycobacterium leprae is proposed to be transmitted by aerosol. So a major area of interaction of the immune system with M. leprae is in the nose and upper respiratory tract. So, but the, the easiest area to, to obtain cells is certainly the skin. More recently, uh, we are beginning to have some information about uh, circulation in the blood of, of human resident memory cells. We are beginning to take a look at this. Probably it would be very nice if, if from the looking at the blood, we could already have an information about what's going on in, in different tissues. So when we started looking at response to to M. leper in, in in the blood, we stimulated the cells with um, a recombinant ML mycobacterium leprae protein, uh, ML nineteen fourteen C. And, and you can see here that we are able to detect uh, T cells that are FOX P3 positive and po negative for CD154 positive for CD137. So uh, previously, people from in Germany, Bachery and co-workers uh, demonstrated that this population is enriched for antigen-specific uh, regulatory T cells that have demethylation of FOXP3, stable expression of FOXP3 and regulatory function. We certainly see this as a preliminary information in this area. And we are using this kind of assay to detect M. leprae uh, T cells, Fox P3 positive T cells responsive to uh, M. leprae antigens. And also, when we look at uh, T cells that are negative for CG137, positive for CG154, we can get the cells that are producing gamma interferon, simultaneously producing gamma interferon and expressing CD154, or only producing gamma interferon. When When we look at the proportion of, of the cells, this is a, a preliminary observation. We began to do those experiments and uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic, but we had to interrupt the experiments for a long time during the pandemic. But you can see here that if you have healthy individuals from endemic area, uh, to uh, palsy bacillary leprosy patients and multi bacillary leprosy patients, uh, the ratio of T regs responsive to M. leprae uh, uh, increases uh, as you increase the, the bacillary load. You see this with an M. leprae sonicate, and you can get what would be a, this similar. Uh, picture with this recombinant uh, mycobacterium leprae protein. Well, this is how we, we were doing these assays prior to the pandemic. We analyze and sort the cells in this, in a flow cytometer that reaches uh, 12 parameters. We are moving now to a new cytometer that 
is a beginning operation and can reach 30 parameters. Um, and the, the cells from the tissue uh, have a programmed enzymatic dissociation in, in, in this kind of equipment. And they can be used for flow cytometry and also for, we are planning starting now for single cell experiments in immune profiling and single cell gene expression. This is just to show in comparing blood and tissue. In tissue, we had to interrupt in, uh, after very few biopsies, but basically most all the cells here are, are effector, we have an effector memory phenotype in uh, multibacillary leprosy patient biopsy. And this is a view of the cell expressing Fox P3 by immunohistology. Well, and, and in some of the pulsibacillary patients, when we take serum from those patients and analyze by mass spectrometry for a metabolomic analysis for lipid metabolism, you can reach in, in, in pure neural leprosy, this kind of separation between people with non-leprosy peripheral neuropathy and peripheral leprosy neuropathy of pure neural leprosy. This is important because some of these patients don't have skin lesions, they have only nerve lesions. So you have to differentiate them from other peripheral neuropathies like diabetes, autoimmune neuropathy. Well, if we move to the post pandemic period, we can see that in right before the pandemic in 2019, we have more than 200,000 new leprosy cases in the world. And 14,000 of the, those cases were in children with less than 14 years. And the leading countries uh, in, the, in leprosy cases were Brazil, India, and Indonesia. But you can see now that if you are investigating leprosy and in many other human diseases, you, you have serious problems now because we had a 40% reduction of new cases in leprosy, detection of new cases in leprosy in Rio de Janeiro in 2020, if you compare with the previous year. This is a problem that is happening probably to many other diseases. In a major cancer center in, in Sao Paulo, the Hospital Israelite Albert Einstein, they had a 57% reduction in onset of treatment of new cases of cancer when you compare 2019 to 2020. Well, we are increasing the number of vaccinated individuals now. And in November 20, we had 68% of the population 12 years or older in Rio de Janeiro vaccinated. So a new normal, let's say, as this the control of the disease improves. So we are moving now to a new approach in, in, in leprosy pathogenesis, selecting volunteers with different levels of exposure in several uh, healthcare units. We, in order to compare with normal tissue, we are beginning to work with plastic surgery samples and material from organ donors for transplantation. In, we are starting uh, our new protocols for isolate, working with 
cells from tissue and blood in our volunteers doing immune profiling and, and single cell gene expression, then we would like to integrate the metabolomic analysis and sequencing in, in these experiments. And of course, once you have all these dimensions, you will improve, have to improve your in silico models that will explain what's going on. And in order to do that, we establish new collaborations and you have the opportunity to uh, watch the conference of the of our new potential collaborators in, in this approach. We think this can also be used by people working in, in Brazil and other countries that have interest in developing this kind of approach in Brazil. And the network of technological platforms of Fiocruz can be an experimental models. Well, this is just to show uh, uh, our group before the pandemic. You can see that it was a very different lifestyle. This is uh, the group from our lab and the flow cytometry core facility. Actually, how the group looked right before and in the first period of the pandemic. In this, uh, finally, I would like to just to thank all our collaborators. And you have people collaborating those experiments from our laboratory, the Laboratory of Leprous Disease in Colorado State University. Well, thank you very much. Okay. I think we are right on time for the presentation of Dr. Ethan Shevak. And just a really almost unnecessary introduction of our first speaker of this virtual meeting. Well, Ethan, as all the immunologists that are watching this meeting know, uh, made some really fundamental discoveries in, in, in modern immunology. And we can say that he is one of the greatest immunologists of the 21st century. And, but he made some very relevant contributions before this century. And I would like just to mention uh, that he discovered the restrict, MHC restriction in the interaction of ancient presenting cells with T cells, something that is really fundamental for what we are doing now. Ethan also created critical reagents that allowed Shimon Sakaguchi to identify regulatory T cells and start the modern investigation in, in regulatory T cells. And finally, he one aspect that's really amazing about Ethan is that he is always starting a new phase in his investigative career. And to hear from someone with this level of experience in this time when we are all starting a new phase in our careers, because of these global events we are having it is can be really useful. So uh, without further ado, I will uh, in, have to, you have Ethan. Let me see if I can find my uh, presentation. Okay. Can you hear me and see me, uh, see the talk? Yeah. Okay. So first, a few words of what I would call immunophilosophy. Uh, I'm not sure why you, Geraldo, other than we're old friends, why you invited me to this meeting. 
I'm probably the least omics type investigator uh, in the in the in the present environment. Although I work for the Laboratory of Immune System Biology, where half half of the of the senior staff uh, is involved in omics research, I have sort of avoided that topic. And I'm going to show you some new data that we've generated primarily during the pandemic, actually, uh, not rapidly, but slowly. Uh, and I, I call it counterintuitive. Why? So this is the, and Geraldo alluded to this, this is the role of the MHC in an antigen presentation. And we all know this, the MHC class one presenting uh, in this, on this um, uh, cartoon slide, viral proteins. MAC class two presenting extracellular proteins. And one thing we all know is that antibodies to, M and to MAC class one and MAC class two uh, inhibit T cell activation. So what I'm gonna show you today is the opposite, that antibodies to MAC, in this case, MAC class one, actually enhance immune activation. Uh, it's a little bit different than it's gonna be on this slide. And maybe in September, if, we, if I have the opportunity to come back, I'll talk about how antibodies to MHC class two can also enhance immune activation. The MHC, the MHC two talk involves regulatory T cells, but today you won't hear any mention other than a negative one of regulatory T cells. And th th this is a classic cellular immunology talk. Uh, so I've been doing this for the past 50 years. And for those of you that like what you're doing and don't necessarily want to change or even enter the omics age, I'm gonna give you a, a bit of advice in a sense, stay with what you're doing, listen to the other people doing what they're doing. But if you're happy doing what you're doing, you can still be successful. So going back 50 years, I, I decided to you know, think about uh, who was the first one who showed that antibodies, in this case, the MHC class two, could inhibit T cell activation. And lo and behold, it was me, uh, so, so something nice, way back in 1972 in a paper in the Journal of Experimental Medicine, where antibodies, this is a guinea pig experiment. We didn't even know what MHC class two was, but in retrospect, these two antisera recognized exclusively MHC class two antigens in the guinea pig. And anti-2 serum, oops, I'm sorry. Anti-2 serum uh, suppressed the response to the, to the MAC class two link gene, GL, and didn't touch the 13. And anti-13 serum suppressed the response to GT, a 13 uh, MAC uh, IA class 13 antigens suppressed uh, the GT response, but not the GL response. So I take credit for this. So one of my postdocs in the lab posed to me the question, and this is gonna be mostly an in vivo talk actually, what would happen if we injected antibodies to MHC class one in vivo? And we looked through the literature and no one had ever done this. Uh, why not? I'm not exactly certain. Uh, and this has to do primarily with NK cells rather than T regulatory cells. And NK cells in the mouse express LY49 antigens which in, uh, come in two classes, inhibitory receptors and activating receptors. Uh, primarily they see uh, MHC class one. So one way of enhancing immune responses would be to block an inhibitory receptor. But that's actually a very complicated experiment with NK cells because these receptors are stochastically expressed. So for example, LY49A and those, uh, and those strains that express it is only expressed on a small subpopulation uh, of NK cells. So blocking LY49A's interaction with MHC class one would, would not prove to be very useful. Although clinically people, as I'll show you, are trying to actually do this. But what would happen if we could actually block class one? So what happens when you administer class one, anti-class one antibodies to a mouse? So this is the TCR interacting with MAC class one right here on top and the peptide is uh, in pink sort of in the groove here. This is one of the, from the crystal structure, this is one of the NK cell antigens, LY49A interacting with class one. And it's been shown that LY49A 
interacts with class one uh, at the same site where beta two microglobulin interacts with the alpha three domain of, of MAC class one. And as you can see here in this cartoon, if you NK cell C self MAC, but if you could block self MACs, for example, with an antibody that reacted right here, you'd, uh, you would predict that uh, NK cells would become activated. So all you had to do was find an antibody that would react right here and it wouldn't block T cell recognition. And luckily my postdoc, when he came to ask me what antibody should I inject, I suggested this particular antibody. So this is ancient technology. This is one of the first antibodies uh, made to mouse uh, H2 antigens in Tim Springer's lab by Matthew Mesher and collaborators way back in 1981. Uh, one advantage of this is you can buy this antibody from BioXL in rather large quantities for a reasonable price, and it's purified and ready to go. And it, in, it actually interacts with, I'm going to show you in great detail, with exactly this site on MAC class one. It's a pan MAC class one, reacts with uh, MAC class, all MAC class ones in the mouse. And I'll also show you that it doesn't inhibit T cell receptor recognition, because you don't want an antibody in this case that's going to inhibit T cell recognition to enhance an immune response. So to start off with, just to show you that, that, that this antibody uh, reacts with the beta 2M site, if we stain cells with this antibody, we can block staining with anti-beta 2M, we can block staining by the antibody itself, but we can't block staining with an a conventional aloe antibody to KB or DB. And this works the other way around. KB or DB blocks KB staining, but not M142 or beta 2M staining. Beta 2M blocks M142 staining. Okay, and then uh, in a collaboration with David Margulies' lab around the corner from my lab here on the 11th floor of the clinical center, we prepared recombinant LY49A and uh, tested its binding. And it binds very well to BALC splenocytes, to the class one molecule. It's not blocked primarily by antibodies to uh, KD, KD or DD, but it's blocked quite nicely by M142. So this is exactly the kind of antibody we wanted. Third, uh, second point, it doesn't block T cell receptor recognition. So here we took OT1 splenocytes that recognize the famous synfecal peptide. If we add synfecal, we see uh, T cell proliferation as demonstrated by CTV dilution. We can block this uh, response with an antibody that recognizes the complex of synfecal and KB, which was originally made in Ron Germain's lab. But we, and, and, but we can't block it with M142 or to the wrong H2 uh, antigen. So this one is presented by K and B. So M142 meets our criteria. It doesn't block T cell receptor recognition, but it does block LY49 binding. So what happens when you inject this antibody in vivo? And this is exactly the experiment that I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show it to you multiple times. Uh, we haven't done it millions of different ways. Uh, Abir Panda, who's a postdoc in my lab, who's completely responsible for this series of experiments uh, and really uh, displayed, displayed great initiative in thinking about how to do these experiments, decided he would inject them on days, he would inject the antibody on day zero, two, four, and six. On day eight, we euthanize the mouse and look in spleen. And what do we see? We see a tremendous proliferation of NK cells. So NK cells are proliferating at a reasonable level as judged by KI6, KI67 expression. And you'll see a lot of KI67 data. KI67 reflects the previous experience of the T cells over the past two days. So a KI67 positive cell has proliferated in roughly the last 48 hours. And if we give M142, look on day eight, what we find is roughly almost all the NK cells, 79% in this particular experiment, uh, have, have proliferated. Curiously, we see no increase in the absolute number of NK cells. So what we think is going on here is the NK cells are being activated because we're blocking their inhibitory receptors. 
uh, but then actually dying. So the NK cell number remains constant. And this isn't restricted to NK cells. What we also see is an enhanced proliferation. And I'm showing you here uh, absolute numbers rather than KI67 expression, but you'll see that in, in subsequent slides. The absolute numbers of memory phenotype, um, CD4 positive, CD44 high, CD62L low cells uh, increases by about one and a half fold. Central memory CD8s uh, expand. And most prominently, we see a tremendous expansion of effector memory, uh, effector memory CD8 cells. So I said this has, uh, curiously again, when we do this, we see no effect on T reg cells. They're gonna be the only population in this mouse that's been treated with this antibody that doesn't proliferate. And we can come back and discuss potentially what that actually means. Not only do we see enhanced proliferation, but we see a markedly enhanced cytokine production, both by NK cells and by memory phenotype T cells. So NK cells have enhanced numbers of interferon gamma producing cells, granzyme B expressing cells. Almost every NK cell that, that, that we can detect on day eight is granzyme B positive. Same holds true actually for CD4 memory cells. They make gamma, they actually express granzyme, about 50% of them express granzyme after exposure to this antibody. And the same holds true for memory phenotype uh, CD8 cells. So we see tremendous activation of NK cells, memory phenotype T cells. Um, and this is just to show you, this is a control slide, that if we inject alloantibodies, conventional anti-H2 class one antibodies, not much happens. We do see a little increase in the proliferation of NK cells, uh, nothing in their total number, but most importantly, we don't see cytokine induced activation and the same holds true for the memory phenotype CD4 is a little bump. This is 15 to 20 in KI67, but no evidence of enhanced gamma interferon production. And even with the CD8s, basically uh, very little happens. So this is a unique property of this particular antibody that sees this, this site on MAC class one. How does this work? What we, what we decided to do was to neutralize gamma interferon. So we simultaneously give the antibody M142 and anti-gamma interferon. So M142 raises the proliferation of the NK cells, 24% to 61%, and that's completely blocked by anti-gamma interferon. Now, most of you know that gamma interferon is not a proliferative, it's not a cytokine that induces proliferation. If anything, it's regarded as an anti-proliferative, interfering gamma is regarded as an anti-proliferative anti cytokine. Um, so that's not what's mediating the proliferation. And we'll see in a moment what we think actually mediates the proliferation. And the same holds true with the memory phenotype, CD4s and CD8. In this case, we can, we can show that it requires NK cells and requires uh, gamma interferon. So we see this bump, let's look at the CD8s, it's even more prominent. CD8 proliferation goes from 30 to 83. I'm apology, I have a very loose screen here that's doing this. Uh, um, the, the CD8 proliferation goes from 30 to 83. We can block that if we deplete NK cells this is a depleting anti-NK cell antibody, anti-NK 1.1. We knock the proliferation down to 46%. If we also give anti-gamma interferon along with M142, we knock it down to 34%. So it requires the presence of NK cells. The response of the conventional T cells requires the presence of NK cells and requires their ability to produce uh, gamma interferon. What's actually mediating this? So it's been known and, and described uh, primarily by the late Tom Waldman that uh, interferon gamma produced by uh, all, all cell types, but primarily by NK cells, uh, induces IL-15 production 
by a variety of antigen type presenting cells. And what I'm showing you here is the response of B cells, monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells to M142. <coughs> we see an increase in the expression of the IL-15 receptor alpha, which usually means that the IL-15 receptor alpha has IL-15 on its, uh, it, it binds IL-15. <coughs> and we're actually detecting IL-15. We can show that these cells actually make IL-15 at the message level. <coughs> the enhancement of IL-15 expression is also blocked both by depleting NK cells and by neutralizing interferon gamma. <coughs> if we look at antigen presenting cells, even though we're injecting anti-MHC class one, we see enhanced expression of MHC class one on dendritic cells and it's markedly enhanced MAC class one expression, MAC class two expression on dendritic cells. And we see the same thing on monocytes, on CD11B positive cells. Uh, enhanced MAC class one expression and enhanced MAC class two expression. So this could all be mediated, uh, presumably by IL-15 produced by APC. Uh, this is one aspect of this experiment that we don't understand. So I showed you that NK cells, conventional T cells, T memory cells proliferate, uh, but also antigen presenting cells proliferate. Uh, and looking at KI67 and actually in numbers. So we see an enhanced uh, proliferation of dendritic cells, of monocytes, but not of B cells. So B cells stay the same. And we see actually demonstrable increase in the absolute numbers of dendritic cells and monocytes. And this is again mediated by NK cells. So NK cells are making something that's mediating this proliferation of APCs, presumably not IL, uh, interferon gamma, uh, and it's neutralized. It, it requires interferon gamma, but is not mediated by interferon gamma. So we haven't quite figured out what NK cells are making that's giving, uh, uh, that's inducing APC uh, proliferation and activation. There are several candidates like MCSF or GMCSF. We don't have clean data showing that they're uh, uniquely involved and we're still working on that. The in, but, but, but pretty clearly the expansion of CD8 memory cells and CD4 memory cells is mediated by IL-15 because if we neutralize IL-15 uh, IL action by using an antibody to the IL-15 receptor beta chain, sometimes known as the IL-2 receptor beta chain, CD122, we completely block the expansion of the CD8 memory cells. And then we, we would re reduce their absolute number as well. So it's IL-15 that's working on the T cells, but we don't know what's working on the APC. All right. So how do we interpret, what, what do we see functionally? That's what you're really interested in. How does, how does this all work? And we started off with, model, uh, with a model of viral infection that we've, we've used extensively in our lab over the years, that many, many people have used, that's extremely well characterized, which is the response to lymphocyte uh, choreomeningitis virus. And this is Armstrong. This is an acute viral infection. So we use, our, we use a slightly different uh, time course of the regimen. It's two, four, seven, and 10. And we look at the splenocytes on day 15. So first of all, what I'm not showing you is that the, the mice clear virus normally. Uh, in this model, the mice clear the virus by day seven. And it's really tough to see enhanced clearance of the virus in this particular model. You really can't show it on day four or day five. They, uh, uh, it's a vigorous, strong, uh, tremendous immune response that, that works 100% of the time. So seeing enhanced viral clearance is tough to see. But what we do see is an enhanced number of viral peptide specific T cells, both CD4 cells, which recognize this GP66 peptide, and of course CD8 cells uh, that see DB, uh, GP33. And this is uh, not only in their enhanced percentage uh, numbers, this is absolute number of peptide specific cells, but we see an enhancement 
of their ability to produce gamma interferon. So we're clearly enhancing the immune response, but we're seeing nothing. On, I mean, you, you basically can't see an enhancement of viral clearance. So we thought we were very smart and we, and we work with chronic viral infections. And this is LCMV clone 13. And we injected uh, the antibody M142 using the same kinetics that we use for the acute viral infection and everybody died. All the mice died by day 14, 100% mortality. And we were somewhat depressed that this wasn't gonna be a great way to, to treat anything if 100% of the mice with a chronic viral infection uh, actually die. But if you go back through the literature in the paper uh, from, by Dan Barber when he was in Rafi Ahmed's lab, when he was demonstrating that one could enhance immune responses to chronic LCMV using basically the same kind of protocol with anti pdl one antibody, he observed, he observed exactly the same thing. So this is giving the antibody during the acute stage of clone 13 infection. And for those of you that had any experience with this, uh, the mice are sort of shaky uh, in the absence of treatment. They usually don't die between day seven and 10, although in, uh, in, uh, occasionally a mouse will die. But this mouse is in, in, uh, undergoing an, an acute, acute infection with this chronic clone 13. And if you enhance that acute infection, uh, you produce basically a cytokine storm, which we've actually demonstrated in this particular model. So what should we do? Well, we follow the lead of Dan Barber and Rafi Ahmed and went to the chronic stage of infection. And this proved to be a much more fruitful uh, avenue of exploration. So we waited till day 23 after uh, post-infection. And by day 23, the mice have established clone 13 uh, chronically. Many of their T cells have undergone exhaustion, produced less cytokines. And we treated the mice every three or four days with the antibody and then uh, euthanized the mice on day 40. This is exactly the protocol we use. And what we saw was an, uh, clearly an enhanced number of viral antigen specific peptide specific T cells here in the blue. You can see that the three different ones that we've looked at. So we're sort of re reversing the energy. And this is somewhat similar to what the, uh, Barbara and Ahmed saw uh, giving anti pdl one But most importantly, we almost completely cleared the infection from non-lymphoid uh, non sites. So from liver, this is in logs, we went way down lung, and kidney. By this point in time in the chronic infection, the mice have already cleared by day 40, they've already cleared the virus from the peripheral blood. So we didn't look at peripheral blood. Uh, but you can see here that we've augmented the immune response to such an extent that we've cleared this viral, almost cleared this viral infection. So this is a very potent enhancement of the immune response uh, leading to clear clearance of the virus. So we're interested in viral infections and uh, we work for the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. We're sort of uh, not supposed to be interested in tumor immunology, um, but we became very interested in tumor immunology. So this is the immune response of mice to, uh, I would say a relatively easy to treat tumor called MC38, as you'll see uh, in lots and lots of papers on tumors. Uh, and we treat, we implanted the tumor and simultaneously treated the mice with the anti-MAC class one antibody M142. And you can see here, we markedly reduced the size of the tumor. I think this is on day 20. And th this did offer a certain insight because if we depleted CD8 cells, the tumor came back. But also if we depleted NK cells, the tumor came back. So th this particular augmentation by this anti-class one antibody induced NK cells, but also in induced uh, adaptive immunity to the tumor uh, mediated by CD8 cells. So this is an easy tumor to treat. So we went to a much harder tumor to treat. And that is uh, the melanoma B16F1. And we implanted B16F1 
And B16F1 is a classically PD-1 resistant tumor. And we treated, as you can see here, up to day 18, analyzed the mice on day 20. And probably the, the visual pictures are the most impressive. We markedly enhanced the immune response to B16. Under these conditions, PD-1 has no effect at all. Anti-PD-1 has no effect at all. It doesn't, we didn't really see much enhancement by giving M142 and anti-PD-1, uh, but M142 is so potent by itself. Um, these are the, the plots of the, of the size of the tumor, same experiment. And here we could actually measure tumor specific T cells. So this is, these are T cells that bind the GP100 tetramer, uh, which is expressed, uh, the GP100 is expressed by B16F1. And we enhanced the, uh, the absolute number of CD8 positive uh, H2DB GP100 tetramer specific cells. Anti-PD-1 doesn't do this, and there's no effect of adding anti-PD-1 to M142. So we continued with tumor immunology studies and decided to really sort of uh, brave it and do it uh, what, what people in this field using B16F10 would regard as a pretty heroic experiment, delaying the treatment until day seven, believe it or not. Uh, that in general, treatments of uh, B16F10 do not work on day seven. You can see how big the tumor becomes on day 20. But we also saw an effect by treating, by doing a delayed treatment, uh, initiating treatment on day seven. Now, NK cells classically are regarded as a population of effector cells that control tumor metastasis. And in collaboration with a Jonathan Hernandez group in the NCI, we evaluated the effects of M142 treatment on controlling tumor metastases. So this is a pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma model where one injects the tumor on, on day zero intrasplenically and immediately does a splenectomy. So the only tumor cells in the mouse are the ones that last until you do the splenectomy, basically five minutes after injection. And the mice that, and, uh, develop, as you can see here, rather large tumors in their livers. Uh, so here, uh, the, the tumor metastasizes uh, e easily. And if we give M142 starting on day three, we completely suppress the tumor metastases, as you can see here visually. So this is a very powerful tumor, a very powerful treatment that's capable of controlling tumor metastasis. And we did this a number of different ways. Uh, this is injecting, this is a therapeutic model, and I'll go into this in a little more detail. This is injecting the same uh, pancreatic adeno uh, adenocarcinoma, KPC LUC2, in the tail vein. And it takes a while for the tumor to become established. So if you look here on the luciferase uh, assay, uh, the control mice have tumor and it sort of goes away. The NK cells control it. And by day 14, it comes back. And we start the treatment on day 14 and we actually prevent, to a major extent, the development of tumor metastasis, in this case, uh, in the lungs. So a pretty powerful treatment capable of controlling tumor metastasis uh, a number of different ways. And this is in the B16F10 model, uh, again, injecting in the tail vein. We see tumor metastases to the lung, and there and you can see them up here. So tumor metastases in the lung, and that's controlled by M142 treatment. And what we see when we treat with M142, and this is a tumor nodule in the lung, is that it's invaded by staining for CD8 cells in black uh, following M142 treatment. And you don't see that in the control treated mice. So Abir insisted that I show this slide. It's a new experiment. And he wants, he wants to make the point that M142 is the greatest treatment of all time. So this is comparing M142 treatment with anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1, uh, the classic checkpoint inhibitors, and a combination of anti-PD-L1 
and NT, NT, NKG2A. So NKG2A is not a member of the LY49 family, but it's another inhibitory receptor expressed on NK cells. And actually this comes from a paper that this, this, this combo comes from a paper claiming a therapeutic effect in a different model of this antibody combination. But as you can see here visually, pretty clearly, uh, M142 was terrific and all the other treatments basically fail. But more importantly, what we see with M142 is again, uh, a, an innate immune response followed by an adaptive immune response. And the adaptive immune response is measured by specific uh, tetrama uh, analyses on CD8, GP100, the, the number of CD8, uh, here it's percent of, of CD8, GP100, uh, tetrama positive cells is only increased by M142 treatment and not really significantly by any of the other treatments. This is T, TRP2, another TRP2, another uh, peptide specific for this tumor. And if we gate on these, uh, if we gate on the pe peptide specific uh, cells and measure cytokines, we see an enhanced, let's see, do I have it here? Oh, nope, this is just numbers, no cytokines on, on this slide. These are the numbers, absolute numbers of, of peptide specific, tumor peptide specific T cells. Here are the actually numbers of uh, cytokine producing cells. So when M142, 80, 65% of the cells produce granzyme B, similar, a similar percentage produce uh, interferon gamma. And again, only the peptide specific cells from the mouse treated with the M142 have enhanced cytokine and granzyme B production. So how do we think this works? So we think it starts off with blocking uh, the interaction of LY49 or NK inhibitory receptors in more general terms with MAC class one. And it blocks M142 sees that site on, uh, on, on class one where these NK cells interact. And that starts NK uh, cell activation the production of interferon gamma. And interferon gamma kicks everything else off. So interferon gamma causes antigen presenting cells to make IL-15. IL-15 works in a forward feedback fashion back on the NK cells to make them make more interferon gamma. And NK cells love IL-15 in terms of proliferating and making uh, effector cytokines. And IL-15 also has a, a pronounced uh, effect on CD4, memory phenotype CD4s and CD8s. So this is a wonderful example of enhancement of uh, the immune response, starting with enhancement of the innate immune response. And as I hope I've convinced you, uh, leading to, in the, particularly in the tumor models and in the viral models that we've studied, enhancement of the adaptive immune response as well. There's only one problem. That's this problem. And this is an America, this is my, my slide for USA talk. This is the slide for the Brazil talk. Can we trans transfer these most experimental results to man? Who cares about treating uh, tumors, even terrifically treating, very effectively treating tumors in the mouse? Can we actually figure out and, and somehow translate this to man? And here we have a gigantic problem. Unfortunately, mouse and man are different in terms of their NK inhibitory receptors. They're different structurally. The mouse LY49s are uh, C-type lectins. The human KIRs, and I'm showing you here is one example, KIR3DL1, uh, and the gene family member. But the important difference is that the LY49s bind to the alpha-3 domain and the beta-2M site on H2D of D, while the KIR3 molecules bind to the top, to, to the groove of the MAC molecule. And you can see the peptide here, and this is the crystal structure from uh, the Mariuzza lab of KIR3DL1 binding to uh, human HLA-B5701. And clearly the KIR binding site overlaps with the TCR binding site. So that's a problem. If we block the interaction of KIRs with uh, the, the human keys with MAC1, we block the TCR binding site. 
So that's not gonna work. But I'm gonna introduce you to something else. There's another family of molecules called LILRBs, which we'll go into in great detail in a minute, that actually mimic the, in man, the LY49s in the mouse. So LILRBs were described, uh, again, this is ancient history, 2003, uh, this came out, the, the crystal structure of this molecule LILRB binding to human HLA2. So LILRBs, which are also inhibitory receptors, bind to the beta 2M site. And look, just like the LY49 bindings. So what about this family of molecules? I, I suspect many of you haven't heard about them. Uh, and we'll tell you about the difference between them and the mouse. So these are called leukocyte Ig-like receptors. And like uh, mouse NK receptors, they come in two varieties, activating, which are nicely called LILRAs, which we're not gonna talk about, which are, have different, uh, one, two, four, and six have a four domain structure. The others have a different domain, uh, one, two, four, and six interact with the FCR gamma receptor to activate. But mostly we're interested in these LIRBs. If you look in the literature, I, I have to mention that these have different names. Sometimes they're called CD85. Sometimes they're called ILTs. The official name is LILRBs. And there are five of them. And they have different, uh, different domains. Uh, and they all have multiple ITIMs. Now the mouse has a couple molecules called peer A and peer B, which are, are the orthologue or resemble the LILRs. They have an activating one, just like LILRA, and an inhibitory one called peer B. The major difference between man and mouse is that the peer Bs are not expressed, peer A and peer B are not expressed on natural killer cells. And uh, I'll come to what they might do, but we really don't know. But they're very different from these molecules. Now, what is the tissue distribution of the LILRs? All I can say is very broad uh, in terms of NK cells, monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, leukocytes, some T cells, some stem cells, and even neurons. And chiefly, the ligands of LIR, LIRB1 B2 and B5 are primarily class one. B3 and B4 uh, have, uh, the ligands are maybe class one, but not clearly class one, and could be lots of other things, including lots of pathogens. And the other ones can recognize pathogens as well. They recognize viruses, cytomegalovirus, dengue, bacteria, a whole variety, bone, something called bone marrow derived stromocell antigen two, on nerve cells, they recognize no-go no -go inhibitory re receptors and also recognize beta amyloid. So a very complex uh, group of molecules with a very wide distribution. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, could they be targeted? Uh, and lots of people are thinking about this. If you look in the, a couple of recent issues of Nature and Nature Cancer, uh, these LIRBs are also expressed uh, by tumor cells themselves, including like acute myelogenous leukemia. Now, for those of you that are stuck with the mouse, the peer B knockout mouse, global knockout, was generated, I think, in 2002. And it is sort of a weird mouse. It, it primarily has a sort of Th2 type uh, immune response. And we haven't looked at it and we haven't, we would have figured it would have a Th1 response because that's mostly what which one sees when, as I showed you, when one activates NK cells. But again, peer B is not expressed on mouse NK cells. So ancient history, again, we wanted to find antibodies against human HLA that would react to the beta 2M binding site, to the alpha three domain of HLA where it binds beta two. And we, we quickly surveyed the literature and actually one of the best antibodies that meets this criteria, and I'll show you in a second one called DX17, W632 dates back to 1978. It was actually created in Caesar Millstein's lab by Colin Barnstable. 
And it, it's just like uh, M142 in the mouse, as is DX17 from the Lanier lab. They recognize, as best we can tell, all ME, uh, human HLA uh, class one molecules, including uh, HLA, E, F, E, F, and G, which is important because some of these uh, PRBs uh, and some of these LIRBs recognize HLA, G, and E. So these are the perfect antibodies. And again, this is studying uh, uh, W632. And this is a, a BACOR study done in, D in David Margulies' lab to show that uh, W632 binds to human beta 2M and human A2, but doesn't bind to human A2 and mouse beta 2M and doesn't bind to mouse D of D with human beta 2M. So it sees the complex of a binding site that involves A2, alpha three domain, and W632. So this is exactly the kind of antibody we wanted to use. And it meets, and both DX17 and W632 meet our criteria. So Kane and Natarajan in the Margulies lab generated some recombinant LI, I left out the other L, LI, LRB1, and did a binding study with total PBMC human monocytes and lymphocytes, so it binds to class one. And the binding is almost completely blocked by DX17 or W632. So again, this is very similar to that early slide I showed you with the binding of LY49 blocked by M142. Exactly meets our criteria. So what I didn't show you was the crystal structure of M142 uh, and, and H2. And we tried to do that repeatedly. David's group tried to do that repeatedly and we could never get a crystal. And that happens sometimes. But we actually crystallized, David's lab crystallized the, the DX17 antibody and HLA-B4405. And this is, and I learned one thing about crystallography. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. This one crystallized in three days. And as you can see here, this is the binding site of the antibody. This is the HLA antigen. This is the peptide groove. It's nowhere near the peptide groove. Okay, you can see it in these two different views. Again, here's the peptide. The peptide groove is here. This is the, okay. Um, the light blue site is the beta 2M. This is looking at it the other way. And this is the crystal structure from uh, the Pam Bjorkman lab of uh, LILRB1 and HLA2. But basically they see the same exact site as best we can tell. Okay, it sees the blue beta 2M site and it doesn't see the peptide groove. So these antibodies are really exactly what we want in terms of blocking the ability of LIRBs to bind to MAC1. And I won't go through this slide. It basically shows that the interaction of DX17 heavy and light chains, the interaction of this, of this antibody with class one requires the interaction of the heavy and light chains of the antibody with the heavy and light chains of MHC class one. So it requires both determinants, which are shown here, amino acid interactions expressed on the HLA class one molecule and, uh, and uh, amino acids expressed on beta 2M consistent with our binding studies. So does it do anything? So how do you do experiments? And as Geraldo mentioned, you're all doing, you know, attempting to do studies on, on human cells. And, uh, and how do we go ahead and show this antibody does anything to human cells? So a, a beer who's very inventive said, well, I'm just gonna add it to culture. So this is the first in vitro experiment I'm actually showing you. All the other experiments have been in vivo. So he took human PBMC and cultured them for four days with either W632 fab or DX17 fab. And I should point out the whole antibodies didn't work. And we don't really understand the reason for that, but fabs and fab twos do things. And we looked at the, at the potential expansion of what we saw was a potential expansion exclusively in this case of NK cells, CD, CD16 high, CD56 dim NK cells going from 11, 49, 80, 47. 
And if we look at total, again, CD16, very bright. And all, all of these antibodies do it. And if we again gate on NK cells for their ability to produce interferon gamma, we enhance interferon gamma production by the six CD3 negative, CD16 positive cells from 13% to 70%. So at least in, we don't see any activation of T cells in this in vitro culture, like we saw with the mouse experiment in vivo, but I'm gonna show you in vivo, it actually does. So we see enhancement of, of NK cell uh, numbers uh, and function. That's what's critically important. And the other thing that's critically important is that these antibodies do not block human TCR recognition. And this is done in sort of a very, I wouldn't say convoluted way, uh, but a, a very specific way. So we obtained from Brian Baker's laboratory, a jerked cell line that has been transfected with a T cell receptor that recognizes a, the GP100 receptor, the GP100 peptide in association with HLA-A2. So this, this jerk cell can bind this particular tetramer. That's that. It's completely, binding is completely blocked by anti-HLA-A2, but not touched really by DX17 or W632. So this again is exactly the kind of antibody we want. It recognizes the, the binding site for the LRBs, but doesn't touch MHC class one uh, recognition, uh, uh, T cell receptor recognition of the brew of the peptide on MHC class one. So how do we show this works in vivo? And these are studies that are actively uh, in progress. I'll show you our preliminary results. And one of them, the simplest study the way to, is to use humanized mice. And the literature is full with experiments on humanized mice. And I was sitting here this morning, I somehow recall that Geraldo and I, when he was in my lab many years ago, did an experiment very similar to this with humanized mice. So Geraldo, I hope you remember, it was a disaster. So we, we took, uh, in, in this case, I, I guess it was skid mice, and we reconstituted them about 10 to 20 skid mice with the blood of, I, th I think of a, a lepromatous patient. So uh, all 20 mice got blood from the same individual and all 20 mice had different results uh, at, a, at a later time point and we couldn't interpret anything. It was so variable. It's still variable, but now we're using NSG mice, which are not, which lack T cells and B cells but also lacked NK cells. And in this case, we've reconstituted them in one model with PBMC, and you'll see the results of that. And in order to look at NK cells, there's a lovely model where one can uh, obtain IL-15 transgenic cells, IL-15 transgenic mice that are producing human IL-15, there should be an H in front of that IL-15, Again, on the NOG background, which is very similar to NSG. So these mice, if you transplant them with NK cells, NK cells proliferate. And lastly, potentially the best model is a humanized mouse that's been reconstituted with CD34 positive cord blood cells. And you do this in a very young uh, NSG mouse, and it takes months uh, for the human cells to differentiate in this particular model. So there are several drawbacks to all these models. One is in this model, you only get T cells primarily to differentiate. In this model, which is everybody says is the best model, you get T cells and B cells, including regulatory T cells. Uh, you get regulatory T cells in the top model as well. Um, and maybe some myeloid cells. So we were very interested in myeloid cells, okay? Uh, and I'm not gonna show you data on this model. The experiments were just done uh, on fr last Friday and we have some data, but it, it's somewhat hard to interpret. The other little drawback of these mice is you can make them yourself. You can get cord blood cells, you can buy NSG mice and breed them, that's El Cheapo. But if you wanna buy these mice, they cost between 1,000 and that's not, it should be 1,200, not $12,000 per mouse. But even at $1,200 a mouse, this is a very, very costly experiment. 
So it, it, even for my lab here at the Rich NIH, uh, we used uh, four of these in this past weekend. So let's look at the first model where we reconstituted the mice with peripheral blood cells and look two days later, injected the mice with W632 two days later, and then uh, euthanized the mice on day six. We had no particular reason to do it this way, but we wanted to get early on after a constitution with PBMC, one gut does get myeloid cells or NK cells as well. And what we saw when we looked in the spleen was amazingly that W632 administration to these mice activated CD4 cells and most importantly, activated NK cells. So this is KI67 going from 15% to 46% in the spleen. Uh, CD8 cells were also activated. So very similar to what we saw by activating normal mice, except in this case, it's human cells that are being activated. And again, if we looked in the liver and lung of these mice, we saw profound ac activation. I'll just show you these because the hour is getting late, 10% to 47% with the NK cells, 11% to 55% with the NK cells in the lung, exactly where you'd want the cells to be activated if you're doing a metastasis model, which is next on the list. And CD4s and CD8s, in this case, CD4s were also activated. Okay, and the second model is IL-15 NOG animals. We injected the mice, what we thought was 10 million CD3 negative cells, so a population that was sort of enriched in NK cells, but turns out wasn't really totally depleted in CD3 positive cells. And again, we injected W632 and looked on day 16. And what we saw here was, again, uh, th these mice already have lots of NK cells, well, by day four, uh, have NK cells by day 14, but we enhanced their proliferation, 45.1%. But also the few CD4 cells that we, that we and, eight, and eight cells that we thought we weren't injecting also underwent uh, pro proliferation. So clearly these antibodies work in a, uh, in a humanized mouse model and are capable, the important thing is are capable of activating hu human cells in vivo. So let me just summarize, show you where we are. We think that blocking LILRB MAC1 interactions in the man, phenocopies, what we've observed by blocking LY49 MAC1 interactions in the mouse. The tissue distribution of these LIRBs is much broader than that of LY49. Whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Um, clearly, what's important is targeting MAC1 versus individual LILRs should result in more potent immune activation. That's what we believe. There are companies targeting individual LILRs, and that's why I bring that up. And there is some preliminary data uh, that those have their, uh, using one, say, anti-LIR uh, B2 can have some therapeutic effect. Um, we like to think that potentially W632 or DX17 could be developed into therapeutic reagents uh, for lots of things, for treatment of cancer, uh, either alone or with potentially conventional checkpoint inhibitors or cancer vaccines. Um, based on the studies we've done in LCMV, uh, we think potentially one could look at chronic bacterial, viral, or parasitic infections. These could also function as sort of adjuvants to be administered with weak vaccines. And we have a little bit of data using uh, M142 in the mouse model that we can convert, for example, a pathogenic Th2 response to a Th1 response for the treatment of asthma. So if we treat mice where we induce uh, pseudo asthma by immunizing with OVA and challenging the mice, we can inhibit the immune, we can inhibit the, uh, the antigen specific challenge by treating with M142. And these studies are also in progress. So at the NIH, we always have very critical people around and they say, this is no good. It's the potential toxicity is a, is a huge problem. So I showed you that every possible cell in the mouse model where we've done it uh, is activated. The only time we've seen any toxicity is in chronic LCV during the induction phase of the chronic infection. And that's really to be expected but we haven't seen any toxic effects of immunizing M142 for a period of 20 to 30 days uh, to, to, to normal mice or to tumor mice. 
Uh, we see a little bit of rise in liver enzymes, but really very modest. And we're, we're not clear that the toxicity is gonna be a problem. So why is toxicity, why is this model different from other kinds of models? Well, other kinds of immune enhancement models uh, in general are based on enhancing IL-2 type responses uh, by either giving IL-2, for example, uh, and lots of people thinking of all kinds of IL-2 mimics to give to mice to treat tumors. The one thing we didn't see in this mouse and probably indicates that IL-2 was not induced in vivo by treating with M142 is an enhancement of regulatory T cells. And actually that's probably a good thing. Uh, so this is a different kind of immune activation. And we think primarily based on interferon gamma and IL-15. So just to thank the people that have done these experiments, the real major mover is a single postdoc in my laboratory, Arbir Panda, uh, helped by a bunch of other people. We've always had a close uh, collaboration with David Marcoulis' lab, and they, they played an integral part in all of these studies, particularly Kane and Nataraj and Lisa Boyd and John Sheng Jang, uh, and many of the tumor metastasis studies were done in collaboration with Jonathan Hernandez uh, and Surajit Sinha in his lab. Uh, and we actually have gone ahead and patented the use of DX17 and W632. So thank you for your attention. I guess if you're having questions or not having questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Feel free to email me. Um, Ethan. Yep. Well, we, we have, uh, I think, time for two questions. Um, and actually the first question is from Kenneth Golub from the Albert Einstein Hospital in, in Sao Paulo. Okay. He really enjoyed your talk, and he is asking if the liberation of gamma interferon and IL-15 via, let me see here, and the liberation of gamma interferon and IL-15 via M142 therapy, likely via NK producing cytokines and subsequent CD8 cell activation, has impressive anti-tumor activity. Does this trigger any autoimmune activity response or a dysregulation of inflammatory response? So yeah, we're, we're sort of always, again, we're always asked that question. We haven't seen anything, but we haven't done it. Uh, we haven't, for example, we're just doing it now, looking at liver pathology, looking at autoimmune hepatitis or something like that. But we haven't seen a rise in liver enzymes of any magnitude. So it's, it's potentially a problem and everybody asks the question, we just haven't seen it. We can't give the antibody forever because it's a rat antibody into a mouse and it's gonna be immunogenic and eventually neutralized by anti-antibodies. Anti so we've gone to about 40 days and haven't seen any problems. Well, uh, another point, uh, if you think for, for example of using this approach in, in leprosy, and maybe uh, this is the one, one point I was wondering about. Uh, you, you have people, mo most of the time, people that are infected uh, with M. leprae are, have a latent infection. Probably if you can have biomarkers and you may have that allow you to detect latent infection, probably the risk would be lower than using the approach in, in a most multibacillary patient with billions of bacilli. What do you think? That's a good idea. Uh, I, I agree with you. I, I, I'd be somewhat reliant. I mean, again, would you induce cytokine storm basically with this kind of treatment? And, uh, you know, chronic infectious disease is one thing where you'd have to worry about the cytokine storm. The tumor immunology people don't care because they're already used to treating cytokine storm if you have a successful response with checkpoint inhibitors. So tumors are sort of the number one thing you might think about, and, but, but carefully admi careful administration. I mean, the, the, the chronic LCMV infection mouse has, has basically LCMV infection everywhere in all kinds of organs and we treated and we eliminated it. So is that like leprosy? Maybe. Are you planning to, uh, have an 
a human approach with the system. You mean you give it to a human? Yes. Okay, so both of those antibodies that we've, we've shown, W632 and DX17, react with monkeys. So I think we would probably do toxicity studies in primates first. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And you all will be happier with that. Uh, but, uh, but that's why we wrote the patent. Answers so, yes. So you imagine even if you look at, at let's say, uh, problems of immune response uh, during aging, do you think this antibody could counteract some of the loss of effective function uh, associated with aging? I, I've never been a big fan of tremendous loss of effective function associated with aging. So, and as I'm pretty old uh, these days, uh, that, that would not be my first choice of, of things to look at. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ethan and everybody. And we hope to see you soon in Rio de Janeiro. Good. Great.